Welcome to the Psychedelic Passage Podcast. My name is Jimmy Wynn. I am your host here today. We have a really important episode. Our whole ethos of this podcast is about providing tangible, actionable information regarding intentional and ceremonial psychedelic use. And as a part of that, you've all heard me talk so much about the importance of community and how that plays so integral into the psychedelic process in general. What I want to do is I want to put all that aside. Uh, my goal here today is to uh, center something that's that's really important that's been happening over in Jamaica. What we have is, is a, a conversation that we'll be having with a, a guest of ours and um, we'll be talking through what the effect of, uh, of the hurricane has been in Jamaica and how uh, an organization called Michael Meditations has been playing into that local uh, community support. And so I'm very happy to introduce uh, Justin Townsend, who is the CEO and head facilitator of Michael Meditations. Uh, Justin joined the organization in 2018 and uh, quickly became the CEO in 2019. And I understand that you all are celebrating your 10th anniversary this year. So welcome, Justin. Great to have you on the podcast. Great. It's great to be here, Jimmy. Thank you for having us. Yeah, we, we've obviously been chatting for quite some time o- over the years because there's some facilitators uh, at your organization who are also a part of our mm-hmm. uh, referral network. And so uh, I'm really, really happy to be, uh, you know, chatting with you here today, and we'll we'll be talking about a couple of things. I, I think that you know, uh, hearing a little bit about the history of micro meditations is certainly on my radar. Certainly, centering the 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 disaster relief efforts um, of the hurricane that recently just hit Jamaica, probably a couple of weeks ago. And that's really the focus of, of our episode today, but obviously a little bit of, of context uh, as that relates to, you know, psychedelic work is, is, um, is probably pertinent as well. So I'm wondering, uh, Justin, if you could just start by telling us a little bit about your history with uh, Michael Meditations. It sounded like this organization started and you came through maybe about five or, or, or six years ago. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So. I originally joined Micro Meditations as an advisor, um, but prior really to my joining, the kind of retreats that were being held were quite sporadic here and there. It was much more the wild, wild west in psychedelics about 10 years ago. So there weren't really therapists present, there weren't protocols. It wasn't a recreational experience, it was more like a, an experiential experience. And so when I joined, um, having read all the research at Johns Hopkins and seen how that was developing, we really kind of had a vision for how we thought micro meditations needed to operate as a Western contemporary therapeutic model. That's what we've built. That's what we have now. Each team consists of a retreat leader that's typically a, a lead therapist or, a, or a, a psychologist. The vast majority of our team members are therapists or psychologists. We hold between two to three to four retreats a month uh, for an average of about 40 retreats per year. So that's how we operate. We're not shamanic. We certainly embrace aspects of the shamanic and indigenous methods where appropriate, but it's very much a Western contemporary therapeutic model that we operate down here. And to date, we've probably served over two and a half thousand guests, something in the region of six to seven thousand doses of psilocybin in the context of psilocybin assisted therapy. Got it. So it sounds like this is a multi day, multi dosing. Right. Uh, the yeah. type of retreat. So it's uh, we operate a seven day retreat. We do three doses every other day, or one dose every other day for a total of three doses throughout the week. And then following each dose, the following day, a few hours of group integration therapy. So by the end of the week, our clients have had about twenty hours of group integration therapy. Uh, we combine that with one on one therapy as well. And then once the guests return home. We do group integration therapy by Zoom to back up their experience down here as well. Mm, yeah, I, th- I think that's probably one of the biggest pieces of feedback that, that I see from international retreat work. This being one of the more viable legal options for individuals to, to seek psilocybin work nowadays. 
and one of the the drawbacks is is the uh, opportunity for that on ongoing you know in mm-hmm. integration and really great to hear that that's something that you are infusing into you know your your programming absolutely but it's it's safe to say that probably the majority of our guests before they come already work with a therapist mm-hmm. and when they return we either continue to work with those therapists but with the uprising of more and more therapists trained in psychedelic integration that's really useful as well so we extend our own team out where necessary we do our own group inter- uh, group integration work and then many of our guests continue the work with their own integration therapists thereafter as well. Yeah. I'll zoom out a little bit and perhaps ask a little bit more about uh, Myco Meditation's mission. Can you share with me a little bit about the, the why, why you all exist, what it is that you hope to, to do in the world? Well, my, I had my very first ayahuasca experience in the year 2000. I then went on to work with inside ayahuasca ceremonies, over the last 20 plus years, not full time, but uh, you know, working with great medicine men, great medicine women within Europe, and also with great, great clinicians as well. And so having had my own history of mental health issues and having seen how powerful psychedelics were for me, as we look at our mission here, there's a lot of different types of retreat or psychedelic experiences you can have these days, right? You can have the, sh- the full shamanic at one end, you can have the quasi shamanic, You can have a Western contemporary model like ours. Uh, There's a wellness type model, which is typically less doses. It's capped off all the way through to something resembling a medical model, right? So there's a variety of different types of experiences that people can have. Um, We decided to focus on the Western contemporary therapeutic model. Um, We don't have a relationship between therapist and client that looks like this. We go for this kind of relationship. We don't have weeks or months to get to know our guests we have seven days so us showing up authentic authentically in this kind of relationship also helps them to show up authentically and we get an awful lot done in seven days and you know we've learned a lot since we've been doing this having served many many guests many thousands of doses of psilocybin and we took the best of the johns hopkins and yale and maps protocols and then we built upon those for group work And so part of our mission is just to try and develop the gold standard model for psilocybin-assisted therapy in a group environment in a naturalistic setting, such as Mm. we have here in Jamaica. Yeah, thank you for that. I I can tell you that the the two facilitators that are part of our referral network are some of the best. I mean, we we try to keep a pretty high bar in what we Mm. do, and I think that it's very you can tell pretty quickly if somebody understands the depth of this work or not. <laughs> and right, so, right, you know, one right. thing that I'll share is that, um, you know, the, these two individuals that that I'm thinking of certainly get that. And so I think right. that if there's anything to speak about the the impact of, of your work, myself, honestly, like I'm, I'm pretty, I, I'm a skeptic optimist. Like I generally stay pretty optimistic and then because of my desire to protect the integrity of this psychedelic space, I'm also a heavy skeptic as well of organizations, you know, popping up and, you know, you know, things like that. Even organizations that have been, you know, long standing, you know, Synthesis Institute used to be mm-hmm. the gold standard of this type of work and a couple of cu- couple of, of bad plays, a couple of uh, years of not paying their facilitators and, you know, they they are no longer. And so I speak to the to the etherealness of of this of this space right now, and you know, I, I I think that many folks want a level of 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 stability. Organizations who are around for a very long time, who are who are distilled with integrity, and I will say, and I've shared this, you know, many times that the organizations that are existing today are n- not many of them will all be around in 10, 15, you know, 20 years. And, you know, as I was thinking about the damage and, and the trauma that Hurricane um, uh, Barrel has caused, this, this is a Category 5 Atlantic hurricane, which is pretty much the earliest Category 5 hurricane that has ever hit you know, or, or early in the year, you know, so we're seeing right. like that, like extension of, of, uh, you know, cl- climate change and, 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 and all of that. And I was like, huh, man, everything can be washed away in a moment, you know? 
And so I, I do want to spend a, a good chunk of our time, you know, centering and talking about that conversation. But in speaking about the integrity of organizations, organizations that are around for a very long time, like yours, I'm curious, what was the the relationship with the local community when you joined versus where it's at now? I think it's safe to say, you know, we live in a in quite a poor part of Jamaica. Okay, a lot of these people that live here live below the poverty line. They don't have bank accounts. Many can't read and write. Maybe they earn their income by going out fishing, but Jamaica is drastically overfished. And so when they go out fishing, they're lucky they can catch enough fish to feed themselves and any spare Mm. they would sell locally. And that's how they make their money. A lot of people live in board houses or poorly built block houses. So that's kind of the state of things down here. And so we recognize that we are in the community, but we are not of the community. None of us were born and raised here. And we have to be Mm. very, very sensitive to that as well. So we know pretty much everybody in Great Bay Village where we're based. And there's a few good reasons for that. First of all, the transport companies we use, the people that work at our retreat centers are all local, whether they're doing the laundry, cleaning rooms, cooking, working on the grounds, the masseuses we use, we order all of our food and fish locally straight from the sea in the local the local markets here. And so one of our goals is to put as much dollars back into Great Bay as we can. And the last time I did a back of the cigarette packet calculation, my estimate was what we pay out locally is about one million US dollars. Okay. Mm. That is a huge quality of life improvement because all the people that we pay locally here go back out in the community, take care of their families and spend that money locally as well. So that's been absolutely key. As an aside from that, we do micro loans to small businesses. Hmm. We have a women's female hygiene uh, project that we do called Monthly, where we're putting together dozens and dozens and dozens of bags of female hygiene products every month that we give out. We support a local community organization called Lickle, Lickle, not Little, but Lickle Swimmers. Lickle is Jamaican Patois, where we're teaching all the kids to learn to swim. And then beginning a few years ago, my team, um, along with the locals, mapped every single man, woman, and child along the whole of Great Bay Road. We know the kids' ages, their gender, what the toys are they like for Christmas. Then we raise funding from our guests that come here. and They contribute towards that. And then in, in about September every year, we start to either receive toys as donations or we go out and buy what we need. And then every single kid in the village about a day or two after Christmas, the team drives down to every single house and gives a gift wrapped box to that child with a present specifically for them as well. And some of these kids don't even know what Christmas is, or they don't get gifts. And so we are known for doing that as well. And so Mm -hmm. that's how we know the village very well. And we've we've got to know them even better since uh, the hurricane touched down here as well. So we are very integrated. You know, just a little story for the, for, the, for the hurricane part here is in the first few days, we went out into all the back side lanes, right? The board houses, the zinc roofs that were missing. And we were the only people going out doing disaster relief, handing out bottles of water, um, handing out boxes of supplies. And when we asked, like, who else has been through here? Government, other humanitarian relief a- agencies, they said, nobody else has been through here, just the mushroom people. And we are known locally on Great Bay as the mushroom people. So that hopefully speaks to some of the integration and contact that we have um, here in Great Bay as well. That reminds me in a weird way of the of the festival harm reduction and sanctuary work that I do. You know, oftentimes myself and a, a group of volunteers, if we're running like sanctuary safe space work, or I volunteer with Zendo Project, we're working alongside medical teams and and we're kind of the first ones on scene a, a, a lot of times yeah. and and that's kind of the power uh, of this and and uh you know I'm I'm kind of weaving in this notion of uh, a theme that I really tried to to center which is you know here in America we we're, we're so used to thinking about psychedelic use as an individualistic effort. Like, how do I take this substance so that I can alleviate this thing or that I can heal this thing or that I can move past this trauma? And I don't say that that's that's a, a bad notion. I just think that it's a limited notion. And when we're looking at 
indigenous wisdom, if we're looking at Blackfoot wisdom, where Maslow's hierarchy of needs actually originated from, it's about how do we move into these places of healing so that we can return back to our community. And I, I know that our audience has heard me share that, you know, a lot of different times. And so when you think about retreat centers who are primarily going to Costa Rica and Jamaica because of the legal landscape and environment, mm -hmm. and then when you think about those retreat centers being rather high-end, you know, retreat centers, I think it begs the question, how many of those organizations are actually getting involved with their with their local community and, and a lot of this work it is around personal liberation which i think mm -hmm. is is a really key through line of 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 psychedelic work a part of personal liberation is also internal decolonization which is you know that work of okay what is the hierarchy within myself what are the power mm -hmm. systems and structures within myself that need to be dismantled and deconstructed. And then you then apply that lens to organizations and businesses who are out there um, in this like, you know, capitalistic society. And, and you can see how that can get all turned around like really, really quickly. And so it seems to me like these are things like you don't have to do all the stuff that you're naming. No, but there was, but frankly, there was nobody else that was going to do it. I mean, yes, we've had the occasional humanitarian column come in and they but they've got a massive area to cover and two or three days after the hurricane they drove down for one day down the main road threw out some boxes of water and supplies for about a hundred people but missed about 300 so nobody else was going to do anything so we knew we had to mobilize so one of the efforts was to set up a gofundme which i think we did on day two after the hurricane mm -hmm. we set the initial goal as a hundred thousand us we achieved 70% of that in the first 24 to 36 hours. Oh. And then we've now bumped up the target to 150,000. We've had about 430 odd donations through GoFundMe and then some separate sizable donations coming in from our former wealthier alumni. So, and then there's a bank here called NCB, which is matching all the funds that are raised up to a certain limit. And I just had a meeting this morning and we've, we've gathered about north of 200,000 US dollars, and we hope all of it's going to get matched. And that's just earmarked for the work in Great Bay. Okay, so mm -hmm. that's been very important. But until we were able to actually utilize those funds, we had to rely upon our friends in Kingston and Montego Bay and elsewhere to send down bottled water because we lost water, we lost electric, right? And we still don't have electric, and water's just begun to come into the system. So we brought about 12,000 gallons of drinking water in by truck, but it, that only began a few days ago. So all these wow. people have had to drink and eat is what we've managed to source and provide to them. So that's been absolutely essential as well. Wow. I was going to ask how these funds are being used. Are there some of the right. more direct channels of, of importance? You know, one thing that uh, I'm hearing obviously from you is 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 basic resources, access to clean water, obviously mm -hmm. food, and then I'm also hearing what you were saying before about a lot of the local community live in board houses, and so I imagine right. not many of those were hurricane proof. So, can you tell me a okay. little bit about sure. the the greatest importance of need in in Great Bay? Is 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 that right? Yeah. Great Bay, that's right. So. About on day three after the hurricane, I sent my survey team out again, two groups of three, and they went to every single house and mapped once again every man, woman, and child, their medical needs, their medical condition, the damages done to their house and roofs, and, and, and we got the entire list together. And then we prioritized them according to the beneficiary. So if you are old and infirm or have an illness and or you have young children, those are the focus first. And I can tell you that having done the survey, we have about 85 roofs that were zinc that either need partially or fully replacing. Okay, so the last week or so, we've spent estimating the materials, getting quotes in for those materials, and then organizing labor and trades to come in. But wherever possible, utilizing labor and trades that actually exist on Great Bay. So that money that they're earning, which is hurricane rates, goes back into the village again. So We've created a command center uh, where we work from here at our retreat location. We've got a big map up on the wall that shows the entirety of Great Bay. 
We've got a, a monitor with a live map on where every house is marked on there. You can do a rollover and know who's there. And in beginning tomorrow, we are building roofs in earnest. And we're going to go through the village with four gangs, two gangs stripping roofs, two gangs building roofs, and odd jobs here and there. So our goal is to move these gangs into the village, the, the trades gangs, and get most of those roofs done, 80 odd roofs, in the next four to eight weeks. Okay. Wow. And the way that we're allocating funds is 75% is going to roofing. And then 25% is going to fisheries, agriculture. Many people lost their, their farms. Everybody here has a small farm and a small yard in which they're growing something. And so to get them back on their feet again and to really to empower them to rebuild their lives. Wow. And are you working with local government? Is it community organizations or is it just you all? Like, like what's the organization effort there? So... Treasure Beach is, a, is basically six different fishing villages. Great Bay is one of them. You've got Billy's Bay, Calabash, Frenchman's, and Fort Charles. Okay. Um, Great Bay is the largest geographical area and the most densely populated. There is an organization called Breads that is a charity that covers most of Treasure Beach. They are looking after the other villages, and we are looking after Great Bay with our earmark donations. Um, there's been a couple of other humanitarian organizations come in. For example, we put an eating station that was serving 300 meals a day at the end of Great Bay Road. That was really, really useful for the community. Uh, but they've pulled out now because they consider that the initial crisis is over. Um, but there's still old folk that can't leave their houses and can't feed themselves. So we're, 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 we're helping to deliver food to them and get them food as well. Yeah. Wow. I just want to pause and just give a lot of just compassion and 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 love to the folks exp experiencing this level of trauma you know we're mm -hmm. we're we're obviously talking about the the relief efforts and we're talking about okay like what are we doing now but just knowing the uh level of of pain that can cause when when having a home is can be such a stable base like having a mm -hmm. home has such you know healing right. qualities to it and and for these things to be stripped away and also, I don't want to be naive to say that this is the only place where things like this are, are, are happening. You know, I, I will um, spare my own like political views here, but just knowing that the world in a lot of great ways is experiencing like, like a deep level of, of, of suffering here too. Right. And it's a very sobering moment, I think, when the, you know, the majority of our audience are, are Americans here and we have a level, e even the, the poorest individual probably has a, a certain level of, of, of comfort that is not right. um, experienced in other okay. you know, parts of the world. Um, right. Myself and my family experiencing this ourselves, like my mom and dad came over from Vietnam as refugees with, you know, little money in their pockets, had experience, you know, homelessness and, and all of these things. And so I just have a lot of heart for everything that's happening in, in, in that community. What's been really good to see down here is, is the morning after the hurricane, about 4 a.m., I went out on Great Bay Road and there were dozens and dozens of our, of our neighbors and friends and community out there walking the road, just drawers on the floor, shocked. But the spirit even then was quite strong. They're all checking in with each other, finding mm. out who needs help, glad that everyone had survived. And they have a saying here in Patois in Jamaica, and it says, we little, but we talawa. And what that means is we are small as a population, but we are mighty and we are fierce. And, that, and that's talawa, okay? And so that spirit has been strong despite all the suffering and despair. And the community is just rallied around each other. We've rallied around them. They've rallied around us. There isn't a man, woman, or child here that isn't positively touched and somehow engaged in the rebuilding and recovery efforts. So it's a very, very strong spirit here. Very strong. Wow. That level of resilience is, is I'm getting like goosebumps on my skin just yeah. like th thinking yeah. about that. It doesn't mean that there aren't tears. I mean, you know, when we're taking water down for the first two weeks, there's women crying and hugging. There's men crying with thanks because they didn't know when their next case of water was coming that we were providing to them. We didn't know when it was coming in. Mm -hmm. um, so to find a way to get water trucks into the village and get people's tanks topped off, we gave about 100 gallons of fresh drinking water per house. And we just kept that rolling through the whole village until everybody was covered. 
and then the mains pumping stations came back on, began to pressurize. So now that initial urgent need to get fresh drinking water is covered by the water utility company. I see. That's been a real, a real plus. And every day, new good things are happening. Wow. Beautiful. But, but we're getting towards the end of, end of our, our episode, but I do want to, I have a question out of curiosity, which may sure. probably lead into, I think, a more poignant question, but to rightfully center the local community of Great Bay uh, and Treasure Beach, I think is important. I want to just pause for a second and talk about Myco Meditations. I'm curious how extensive the damage was to your retreat center. Obviously, you know, uh, the safety of your staff and and your team. And just I acknowledge that this is th- this may be a, a hard or triggering question to ask. But what about your own, you know, space at, at, at Myco mm-hmm. is, uh, ha- you know, how, how's it, that looking? The area was absolutely devastated and unrecognizable. So we spent, despite what we were doing in the community, uh, we spent all of my team here switched out of therapy facilitator mode and into chainsawing, clearing the debris mode, and doing community work, each and every one of them. we had A few of us had encounters with poison ivy, which wasn't very pleasant, the Jamaican poison ivy. Um, you know, and then my team was finishing up, going back, you know, four of our team houses lost roofs, so we had to put them into one team house, but they had no electric, no running water, no fans. Luckily, we have these Jackery power boxes that at least gave them Starlink access to c- communicate with family. But they've been spending the evenings in stifling humidity. We've had mosquitoes down here, clouds of them. Um, so we spent a couple of days, three days clearing the property, and then more, it's more back out, taking away electric poles, clearing the roads, removing wires so trucks can come down and cars can come up and down. So it's been hard, but you know, how else do you discover the strength and the potential you have and the capacity you have unless it's through adversity, right? You may think you've reached your limit, but then adversity comes along and you have to just dig deeper and you Mm. do dig deep. And so everybody's coming out of this weary and tired, but with a much stronger sense of resilience and a deeper sense of their own capacity as well and what Mm. they're all individually capable of. And I could not be prouder of the Micro Meditations team, um, whether it's our local Jamaicans or the stable of therapists that we have working here with us that was still on the island uh, when the hurricane touched down. Wow. Yeah, this leads into an important question that, that I would certainly like to hear you speak on. And it's similar to how we started this conversation, which was the why around uh, myco meditations. And mm-hmm. what my sense is, being an entrepreneur myself and just knowing how business operates is, Probably the vast majority of business operators would not be doing what you're doing. I think it'd be very easy to collect the insurance money, to focus on your own space, to focus on clearing things out. Uh, Obviously, the uh, usability of your space adds to the revenue that you get that can keep people employed and keep things going. You being the CEO of this, you know, whole organization, there's uh, probably people you have to answer to, your own staff and all of that. And very much here, I, I hear you centering the local community. I hear you saying the morning after we went out, we didn't, mm-hmm. we didn't stay here. Mm-hmm. Why? Why? Why do all of that? Because nobody, well, first of all, nobody else was going to do it. And it was not a, it wasn't really a cognitively led decision. It was a heart led decision. Mm. We just saw all of the suffering around us. And it was just a very natural instinct. I mean, yes. We've canceled five retreats, so we're losing revenue. But frankly, this is not a business that we're building to somehow sell in three or four years. We're in this for the long game. And mm. so, you know, if we had a, a rough year or two with COVID. We've had a rough year now with the hurricane. So we just keep picking ourselves back up and getting on with things again. And we just want to build the best retreat center that there is for psilocybin assisted therapy, be really well integrated into our community. Get deliver great outcomes for the guests that get to come down here, and eventually we, we will expand. But it's not a it's not a hundred meter dash; it's a marathon over time. And so it's just a very very natural instinct. I mean, I we couldn't just sit by and do nothing. So mm. and it wasn't it was it wasn't a collective decision. It just happened that way. It was very organic. 
I am uh, uh, very familiar with making massively irrational decisions from the heart. <laughs> and yeah. so yeah. I have a lot of respect for you, you know, when, when I hear that. And I, I'm reminded of, of this story. You know, John Mackey, who is the founder of Whole Foods, you can have mm. whatever opinion you want about him. But way, many years ago, like almost a decade ago, I heard him speak and he was telling the story about the first grocery store that they opened up. I think this was, was in Texas. The store had experienced the flood and, and destroyed the entire store. And here him, you know, and his staff and his team all there trying to clean up, you know, so much damaged goods and groceries and all of that. And then one by one, all of the community members started showing up, grocery shoppers, people helping, yeah. lifting up shelves, yeah. moving debris and moving all of that. Obviously, Whole Foods is a lot different now, but I <laughs> think that really speaks to this power of community in the areas that, that we serve. And I know that for-profit psychedelic organizations get a lot of criticism. And I think that there's a lot of folks out there who say, oh, well, this should all be for free or, you know, just go eat and eat the mushrooms at home or, you know, whatnot. Honestly, Jimmy, I, I've never understood that argument. I've never understood it, that argument. I mean, yes, there is a certain amount of excessive profit that large companies make and it's never enough but if you are providing a service and good value and you make a profit margin i don't see what's wrong with that and why should psychedelics be any different from any other product or service out there yeah i mean i also just believe that there is an importance of what we value and what we do about it you know it's it's mm. it's, it's not my fault that america doesn't value the sacred I think that many other cultures will value sacred. And if you look back hundreds of years, the medicine keepers were taken care of within their communities. They were housed, yeah. they were fed, they were supported. We don't have that here. And so as we are entering this, you know, kind of late stage capitalistic era where things are over commoditized and things are over commercialized, I sit and say that, you know, community has become proxied by business. That's just that's just one of ju just the facts of, of, of the world that we live in. And so now it's like, how do we have business operators say, actually, I care to infuse a little bit of community in what we're doing, and actually, I'm going to put my dollars there. Okay. So if you want to use the case of America or even Europe, historically, there that, that, were, were three levels, right? You have a cosmology that a group signs up to, right? Where you sublimate the ego to the cosmology, the collective. Then on the next level, you have integration with nature. And then you have the tribe. We no longer have the cosmology. Mm -hmm. We live in concrete jungles. We are not integrated and at one with nature. And then as for the tribe, which tribe do I belong to? Well, we're seeing what's happening with the polarization and the in-groups and the out-groups. The whole thing is disintegrating in many respects, and that's what's missing. Mm -hmm. And and I'm also very aware of uh, savior complexes. I'm also very aware of, you know, kind of these notes of uh, colonization and, and decolonization as it relates to uh, uh, personal liberty. And, and I'm also very aware that the pursuit of personal liberty and decolonization very much nowadays feels like a privilege more than it is a human right. And so I just want to contextualize, you know, the point that I'm making when I hear community suffering so much, when I mm -hmm. hear so much uh, support that is needed out there. And we're not even, we haven't even approached the grief and the trauma and all of that. And I hear what you're saying, well, who else is going to do it? And so, you know, I, I hear, I, I see nonprofits, uh, nonprofit organizations out there doing, it, and I see business organizations out, out there out there doing it. And I also think that, well, I know that those choices don't come easy. Those choices really don't come easy. And so I just have a lot of respect for you, Justin. I, I have a lot of respect for what you're doing and what, what you're choosing to do. I think that that's really powerful and potent. And it is the way of the medicine. It is the way of the medicine. Absolutely, it is. How could it be any other way? Yeah. I, I find that especially with the mushroom, 
what gets composted is what gets composted and what gets repurposed to feed the ecosystem will feed the ecosystem. And so, you know, I, I, I hope that, that all of the efforts of what you're doing are feeding this ecosystem. And so just, just a lot, a lot of thanks to you, Justin. Um, as we wrap up here, do you have like a final message or final word? Then we'll talk a little bit about how folks can, you know, donate and, and contribute, but anything on your heart that you just want to share with our audience here? We've had great support down here from all of the guests that have come through Micro Meditations. We've raised a lot of money. They've been extremely generous. Um, we've had a lot of donations from friends and family and people we know well in Kingston and other parts of Jamaica. The government has just been incredibly slow to move, but finally that's all moving. So we had to cover that lag, okay, between the hurricane hitting and the government beginning to move. But sure. said it's, the government will not effectively and efficiently service all the needs down here. So our ongoing relief work, we're going to be doing for the next month or two, and then hopefully we'll, we'll be back up and running with, with business again in September of this year. But the community as a whole will be a lot more resilient and bonded because of this situation. So mm -hmm. I think it's really important to find the silver lining in amongst all the despair and the misery and the loss. But there won't be a single family here that goes untouched in a positive way by all the efforts um, that we're all doing together collectively down here. Wow. And it seems like the GoFundMe link is the primary way for people to contribute. Yeah, so we'll put that link in this um, episode uh, description. Uh, we'll also find ways to disseminate that to the greater community. If we have any listeners here who are touched by our conversation or motivated to contribute in your own way, I have personally donated a couple hundred dollars myself. Um, on behalf of Psychedelic Passage, I'd also like to donate um, a few more um, additional dollars. This is really just to show everybody here that I put uh, my money where my mouth is and I put my action to speak. And so I really, really uh, highly, highly ask each of you, if you can find it in your heart to donate, uh, we'll post the GoFundMe link. And um, hopefully that, that does make some effect to the greater community down there. One more thing I'd like to say is that every single cent that gets donated is going straight to hurricane relief work. Nobody at MICO is taking a fee off the top. Okay, we're contributing our own time and our own efforts for free. And we will continue over the next two months to do so. Every single dollar donated can really cha help change your life down here. Beautiful. Well, thank you so much for being here with us, Justin. Um, I'm sending so much love to that greater community down there in Great Bay and Treasure Beach. I'm sending a lot of love to uh, that mycelial network that holds you know, all of this and really looking forward to uh, chatting with you in a couple of months to hear the updates on, on all of the beautiful things that are happening there. So uh, that wraps up our episode for this week. Thank you so much here for uh, listening and, and joining in. And again, just a direct ask on behalf of uh, my community here at Psychedelic Passage, on behalf of the Myco Meditations uh, community, if you can find it in your heart to donate, uh, we will uh, find some pathways for you to do that. So sending a lot of love uh, to all of our listeners, our greater community, and thanks for joining us here this week. Thank you all. Thanks, Jimmy, and thank you to your audience.